Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all around the world. I see. Thanks for saying hello uh, in the chat. It's great to see all the places uh, that you are, as they used to say, dialing in from uh, to be with us uh, in this uh, webinar. Today, uh, we're talking about how to find and retain a skilled workforce, and it's our 60-minute deep dive format. Uh, well, you know, the skilled workforce, that, of course, is uh, ourselves, uh, but it's also you know, our teams, our businesses, our organizations, the whole uh, group of human beings that it takes to enable uh, not only us, but our organizations to be uh, successful. Uh, and who could be better to help guide us through uh, this topic than uh, our colleague, uh, George Westerman, who's a senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management uh, and a founder of the Global Opportunity Forum. Uh, George is well known to all of you who are regulars uh, in this uh, webinar series. Uh, he teaches uh, a lot in our executive education uh, program, so you know him from that as well. But he's also a pioneering researcher uh, on digital transformation. He's been in this field uh, really for uh, many years. Uh, his doctorate from Harvard Business School uh, came after about a dozen years of experience in product development and technology leadership roles. So George is not only an academic uh, researcher and a uh, person who has studied uh, and taught about uh, these issues for many years. He's uh, also been very much there himself uh, and understands uh, personally uh, from not only his history, but from the thousands of executives and leaders around the world who have followed his work, attended his courses and participated in the research programs uh, that uh, George has led uh, at MIT and elsewhere. So George, we're so pleased that you've been once again able to uh, spend some time with us to talk about your your research and findings, uh, some of which has uh, just been published and some of which is yet to be published. So people can uh, perhaps hear some things here before uh, there's a chance to hear or read them or see them uh, anywhere else, which is always a fantastic benefit of uh, these sessions. Uh, and uh, we're pleased you're here. Welcome. Uh, and if I may, I'd like to uh, hand over to you to uh, tell us what are we uh, going to be talking about uh, today? Uh, and uh, perhaps you can, oh, here we go. Uh, we've got some, uh, I think some bullets about what we hope we're going to cover. Uh, but I know that whenever we uh, talk and whenever we get questions from uh, our very engaged audience, and um, as you heard, please do put your questions in the Q&A uh, as they occur to you. And we'll get, uh, get to a point to where we can put those questions to George. Uh, but our plan going in uh, is to cover things like how uh, to utilize HR and technology to help our employees chart their careers, how do we provide unique opportunities to learn and practice new skills, and how do we uh, develop, uh, how do we deliver helpful feedback to our people around uh, performance. But those are just uh, some initial uh, goals, and I know that uh, as the conversation uh, and the interaction develops, we'll get to many more questions from all of you. And George, uh, characteristically, has been uh, very willing to dive into whatever questions you would like to ask. So please do put them in the Q and A as we go through. So George, if I may, uh, hand the uh, microphone to you, and and please tell us about your work in this area and uh, what do we need to know. Well, well, thanks, Peter, and uh, thanks to the Exec Ed crew for the opportunity here. Uh, you know, you might ask, why, as a digital transformation researcher caring so much about career development? And it became really clear, oh, after about 10 years, close to 10 years of digital transformation research, about four or five years ago, that one of the key challenges that we had is that digital transformation is happening. It's changing jobs, but we're not doing such a good job of helping people get ready for those changes. And we can do a lot more. Uh, so I got involved in starting to think about these workforce issues as a significant amount of the time I was spending on transformation topics. And so this is part of that, that topic here is how can we help people develop and be ready just to develop in their careers, but also to be ready for some of these changes that are coming. And what do I mean by the changes? But, you know, this was six years ago, right? And we were all worried about what jobs will be left after the robots eat them. And, uh, Lots of concern going on there. Lots of talk in the, the media about this. We even launched a, a work of the future effort to, to make sure that we understood what was happening there. Uh, but, you know, that's just one thing that happened. Then then we other things keep changing here. Certainly digital transformation is reconfiguring our jobs. But then we had this scary pandemic happen. Nobody expected that. It changed the whole way we think about how we employ people, where we employ people and what people expect from their jobs. 
Certainly a new generation thinks differently about their jobs. And everybody having lived through the pandemic is rethinking what they want. And then, of course, geopolitical challenges from that to wars, to supply chain disruptions, to all kinds of things keep changing. And as if that were not enough, then along comes this little guy who is exactly one year old to yesterday or one year old this weekend. And that's changing everything again, because we're back to that question. Well, OK, now these things can write stuff. Now they can do graphics. Now they can do all kinds of things. Do we need to worry about our jobs again? It never keeps changing. And as hard as that is for people in HR, it's actually just as hard for the employees. And that's the real point I want to make here. It's easy to think about this problem as an HR problem. And yet, the, the so many of you have come to this realizing this is actually a talent problem for everybody in the company. And HR will do what it does or it will do what it doesn't do. But we all need to find ways to help improve the talent we've got, the way we develop the people we've got. Because without our people, we can't do anything in an organization. Uh, to give you an idea just how important this is outside of the HR world, we had our annual industrial liaison program, uh, the biggest conference of the year, the R&D conference uh, about two weeks ago. And in that conference, we had half of a day out of the two days, we offered an opportunity to talk about careers and talent. And that was the most subscribed set of panels in the entire two days. So these are R&D managers. They're not HR. They're very, very technical people. And they still chose with their feet to come to a session on talent. So this is not an HR problem. This is for everybody. And the fact that you're here, uh, I think, is a good sign that, that you recognize that. So let's go through and look at So some of the solutions will be fix this in the HR and talent area. But so many of these things we can all use as we develop people. So to, I told you that you know we were worried about the robots taking over. Well, we brought the best researchers uh, throughout the Institute together to look at this. And uh, the, the task force published its findings. And what we found is, yes, technology is changing things, all that kind of stuff. But three out of the, five, out of the six findings are about training and development, right? Uh, labor market institutions have fallen into disrepair. We need to innovate our labor market institutions. Now, that's the economists speak for the external thing, but there are labor markets internally also. We need to cultivate and refresh worker skills. So uh, this is even, you know, the top talents uh, in, in MIT are talking about how important this is to do. And if I didn't hit this topic enough, you know, this was from last year, 37% of the top 20 skills for the average job have changed just in the six years since this, before this article was published. So things are changing really, really quickly. Now, what does that mean? Well, talent's a big concern for leaders everywhere. But let's look at some of the details here. Two thirds of people that we surveyed in a survey that we did uh, said that career advancement's important. Now, who is it not it says it's important for? My uncle, the fireman, uh, the many people I know that are teachers, Right, they're, they they want to develop their skills, but they may not the, the career development. Not all of them aspire to be principals, right? And many, you know, some other people do not want to advance, but we see two thirds of the people in our our poll did. Um, of those, twenty five percent said they're likely to go to a different employer in order to be able to advance, and also half of non managers said the lack of good career advice had hurt their career. So they're blaming their companies, whether right or not, they're blaming their companies for their lack of, of development in what happens there. And if you look externally to other work, just last year, Pew Research and McKinsey, 63% um, of people who changed jobs said lack of opportunity to advance was a major reason. And McKinsey also said the most common reason for quitting was lack of development and advancement. So this is this is the problem here. It's hard enough to find talent. And yet what this says is for everybody we hire, we actually have to hire one and a half or one and two thirds people because of the people we're losing because we're not developing them. And it becomes even more complicated because not everybody wants to develop up. And frankly, developing up is not always an opportunity unless your company is growing really well. And, and, and developing laterally or diagonally, or we did an event in London um, a few months back and they all were talking about the idea of squiggle careers. You know, you're pivoting a lot as you're moving along. Um, how do we make those opportunities happen beyond the straight up that we have also often talked about in companies? The real problem is not just finding an employee or a job for today, whether you're employer or employer. 
Um, because that's just getting you in there. We don't want to lose those people. People need help to grow and they thrive in their careers. So that's enough set up here. Let me just ask you as a group, and uh, Eric, if you could put up the poll, does your company do career development well? And we're not going to let you have an it depends, just yes or no. Do you do, do development well? So go ahead, everybody, and, um, and pop your vote in there. And Eric, you're controlling timings because I can't see how fast things are happening. So just whenever you think it's ready, uh, go ahead and pop up the poll results. Sure. We're about 75% there. Okay, great. All righty. Looks like we're around go for 80. It. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is interesting, right? So uh, around third of you, 29% say that your company does it well, and 71% not well. Not the best, not the best situation to be in, but it does resonate with my experiences in working and also with my discussions with leaders and with uh, others in companies around the world um, that career development is not working the way it should. Now, what's interesting is that um, when I talk to HR leaders, talent and development leaders, and I ask them, how good is your company at career development? They typically say, we're good at it. But then I qualify and I say, how good is your company at career development for anybody who's not a high potential, a leader in the organization? And then the answer changes. And it tends to be, uh, that's the answer I tend to get. Because we companies do tend to focus very much on high potentials and we know how to do those programs well they're expensive they're very high touch but we recognize the need for those the question is what do you do for anybody other than that three percent or so that might be your high potentials or or the percent that's your new managers that are getting that first manager training we need to do more so our work out there has found two common approaches that happen in companies for developing the non-high potentials and I unfortunately have not found a good word for that yet. Um, the average employee, this is the average employee, but the average employee sounds like somehow we're saying something bad about them. The typical employee, there's not a good word for that, but you know what I'm saying. The people you would not consider high potentials, but you still want to keep because they're talented and they're hardworking. Two common approaches I've seen. One is this. Managers are responsible to help people develop in their careers. And so we put, you know, at the end of the annual performance review, you have to talk about development and a manager should be having these conversations all year. And that's one. Uh, the other is this. We give people tools, training tools, other tools, so they can own their own career development and they can do their motion around the company to make it work. Yeah. So both of these are very common approaches when we talk to companies about how they're doing it. So let's go ahead and pop up that second poll, Eric. How, how common are these? in the companies with the people that are attending today. So go ahead. Uh, is it number one? Is it number two? Or, and we added a third one, something else, and you can decide what something else means. OK, let's see what those numbers look like. Give them another minute or two, and then we can go. Um, you know, these are. Um, these are the, the nice thing about this is these are if, if you get these, you know, when you, when you start talking about doing these approaches, they're very reasonable, right? Who, who knows their people better than their managers and who knows better about what they want to do than individuals? And you should open up possibilities for them. So you see here about a third saying managers help people develop in their careers and spot on a half give people tools to own their own career, career development. And then there's something else. There's always a something else. I would love to hear what some of those are. So chat some of those in. If you are a something else, go ahead and chat it in so we can see what is going on there. So here's the thing. These are very, very common approaches. You saw a third and a half, right, are, are doing these things. Uh, they are, they seem inherently reasonable. But the problem is when you're a, an employee, they're not as reasonable as we think. So at the top of the company, we look and we say, of course, this is what we'll do. We mandate, we delegate this to employers. Or at the top of the company, you think, well, yeah, people just need to have the information to, to be able to grow. Uh, for the, the average employee, this doesn't work so well. So why is that? Well, 
if managers help people develop in their careers, well, that implies a few things. One is that my manager wants to help me develop in my career. And that's an interesting question, right? Number two, if I wish to develop my career somewhere other than in the unit I'm in, what happens to me if I tell that to my manager? Are they going to be a good magnanimous person and help me develop? Or are they going to say, well, well, there goes George. I don't have to care about him anymore. And I'm going to focus all my attention on somebody else. Here's the third challenge with managers help people develop. Um, managers are pretty clear with how they moved up. Managers are pretty clear about the jobs that they know about, often in their unit or elsewhere. What if you want to do something else? They don't have the information to get there. Even if they want to help you, they may not have the information to help you do a horizontal or a diagonal move, even if they want to. So the managers help people develop in a career. Oh, and by the way, the, the last one, yeah, I want to help people develop in my career, but we're all really busy. We just never quite get a converse time, time for that conversation. Even in the career development conversation in the annual performance review, yeah, we got to do it, but you know, we give it about three minutes at the end of the hour. So even if managers want to help you, they may not be good at it. And that, 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 assumes that the managers want to help you. Number two, we give people the tools to own their own career development. This sounds exactly right. And to the leadership team, of course, this sounds right, because we have all done our changes to make our career progressions happen over time. The challenge is that as plausible as that sounds, it's very easy to forget, even for the senior team, how much of what we did was purely us working in a transparent or, or open labor market, and how much was the, the fact that somebody took a chance on us? Somebody did a favor for us. Somebody allowed us to take on an opportunity and try something at low risk. Um, we miss those personal connections, the favors, the mentoring that we got that is far outside of owning our own career development. Uh, to add to that, these kinds of processes, when they happen, the networking processes, the uh, the personal development in companies, the development inside, they tend to work less well. They tend to disadvantage employees who come from disadvantaged groups already. And so in a way, these start, these actually make DEI and other issues worse because you're trying to get people who are not on the even footing to compete in what looks like an even footing when it's not. We need to do more to help people move and grow those networks here. Uh, so, well, here's the challenges. Both of these are really interesting sounding approaches. Both of these sound very, very plausible to senior executives and the people that are allocating HR budgets and allocating the way that we do development in companies. But in many ways, they're false narratives. They sound good, but they're not actually working for the people that they need to do it, to, to work for them. So we want to get beyond that. We want to go in and try to figure out what's a good way to work it. Now, I want to go, go into the comments for a second. They were looking at some of the others. Mohammed said, we design career both growth plans with the help of managers and a game of fried approach. To, that would be interesting to learn more about, Mohammed. Uh, career development is powered. Here's Sandy. And we'll come back. I'll, I'll share some examples that look kind of like that also. So um, thanks for sharing that. Sandy, career development powered by the individual resources are provided. I was heavily supported. Okay, great. So you're saying it's you. I think Sandy, what you're saying is a number two, but you also got a lot of extra support from people, which is great. Um, the employees, something else means employees responsible for their career development. That's interesting, Martha, because I thought we had number two, but uh, you're you're clearly seeing something else in number two that we don't see. Uh, Delara, both could be an answer. We didn't give both. That's interesting. And Carrie. If managers are responsible, it needs to be factored into their responsibilities. They don't always have the time. Okay, so we did that. Uh, and here's another one that has nothing to do with it. Can you confirm if the recording will be mailed? This person needs to leave. Okay, no problem at all. All right, so uh, thank you for, for putting those things in there. So we are seeing these approaches there. I've just argued very strongly that in many companies, these are false narratives. They're highly believable, especially to the people making the decisions, but we need to do better than this for the people that actually are affected by these processes. So how do you do this well? Well, we need more than just a bunch of tools. We need more than a bunch of just nice sounding stories. We actually need a coherent system. How can we put this together so it actually works for every employee, not just sounding like it works? We're not just sounding like a bunch of key tools that we can put together over time. Okay. 
So the thing is, as companies, we already know what's needed because we already do it for our high potential people. Okay? We already do it for our leadership development pr programs. We just don't do it for others. So how can we make this happen for all employees, but not have that cost, right? Because it's clearly, we can't pay that kind of cost uh, and, and personalize attention to every person and employee that we can give for the top few percent. Okay? So how do we make it well work well? Well, looking across thousands of employees that we survey, look across dozens of case studies and interviews, we've identified three elements that, that are needed here. Number one, you need to give people visibility. Because so much, you know, because unless you're growing very quickly as an organization, the vertical always has a funnel and the opportunities get shrunk as you move up. People need opportunities to look at what else might be possible. So what other opportunities are available from where you are? And what are the pathways we might take to get there? Number two, as we got that visibility of what might be possible, we need to provide an agile learning approach to help them get there, right? You know, we here at MIT offer two-year master's degrees. That's great if you've got two years to get it or four-year undergrads. We need something more agile than that. And that's why we have our exec ed department, our exec ed programs that allow you to come in and get some skills much more quickly than that. And we also have some part-time programs, our, our Sloan Fellows, our executive MBAs that you can do while you're working. But the idea is you can learn from us and we'd be happy to teach you. But there are other ways that you can learn too. What's really critical there though, is it's not just sitting in a classroom. It's not just collecting that certificate for having sat there for two or four, four hours. It's really, do you get the opportunity to practice also, not just to learn? Because the practicing is where you take these hard concepts and you make them real by figuring out what works and doesn't and what else you need to know. So there's visibility on what's possible for you other than purely vertical. Next is the opportunity to learn and practice. And the last is, are we giving the kind of rich feedback and coaching that we need, right? That, you know, it's great when your boss wants to really look out for you, that's fantastic. It's great when you can find a mentor or a set of mentors throughout the organization that can help you. But that also is a little bit lucky in many cases. What can we do to make this a more constant part of the process beyond just saying, hey, bosses, do this? So what are some examples here? Well, you know, lots of companies are doing different parts of this. So let's look at the pathways, for example. UPMC Medical has a really interesting thing uh, available in the personnel system to anybody. GE Digital did this. They were the first I saw it in UPMC. Um, at UPMC Medical, you can go in and you can say, I'm in this job. Where have people in jobs in my job gone in the past? Now, UPMC has got 200,000 people. That's a lot of people moving around. And so you have the opportunity to say, oh, here I am. I was a lab technician. Um, I didn't know the lab technician could go into becoming a, a nurse, or I didn't know a lab technician could go into marketing. I didn't know those were possible. Here, how would we how would we get there? And so what they do is they show what's possible, and then they say, here are people in those jobs. So if you want to ask them how they got there, you can call them. And it's very low risk because you call the person in the job. You're not calling HR. And so whether or not you trust HR, you have an opportunity to see what might happen and to make a contact you wouldn't have had before. Uh, in, the, in the learning opportunity, there's quite the opportunity to learn and to practice. Um, certainly, many companies have the learning idea going on there. What happens here, uh, Fidelity Insurance, uh, Fidelity Investments is a great example of this. They, when they're training people in call centers, these are regulated products. You have to be very careful what you say and make sure that the advice you give is actually accurate. And what they do, we call it the three I's. Instruction, immersion, and introspection. So what do they do in the morning? You learn about that product that you're going to be supporting. In the afternoon, questions about that product come to you while you're doing your job in the call center. And of course, you have a supervisor listening to you as you're going there to make sure you don't, you know, you don't say the wrong thing. After you've practiced all afternoon, the next morning you come back with the other people who have learned about those products and you talk together about what you learned. How did the training help you? 
What questions do you still have? How might they revise the training and how might you get some extra experience to get there? So here they're learning and they're practicing in the same moment. Another example is, is a little different at Schneider Electric. They're very much about owning your own career development, but they've also put together something very interesting, which is an internal talent market, not only for changing jobs, but for doing temporary work. And so managers can post, I need somebody to run this data science opportunity for me. Um, here's two or three things I need done for me. Does anybody want to do it? And then any employee for the company can say, I want to do that. So imagine somebody just got a data science course that they took and they want to learn some stuff. They can do it in a low risk way on somebody else's data on a meaningful project. First of all, it gives you a chance to, to practice this skill with data science in a real world. But second of all, you now have met a manager you wouldn't have met before. And you can make those connections happen in ways that didn't that you didn't have before. It helps you build those networks. So the, this owning your own career then becomes also linking you into other opportunities. So the, you know that's another opportunity there. And then certainly the coaching and mentoring, um, it happens in different places in different ways. Allianz now is measuring as part of your performance review, you have to talk about what you're doing to develop your, sorry, as part of every performance review, the individual says how they want to develop, the manager is supposed to talk about that, and then the managers get, get some coaching on, on whether that's happening in their people. Uh, UPMC also has a thing called an anytime check-in. And an anytime check-in allows the manager or anybody else in the company to just say, you know, that was a good one. Way to go, George. Way to go, Elaine. Uh, and just send that directly to you or to you copying your manager. So you're getting constant feedback either from your manager or from other people in the company on how you're doing, what you're doing well and poorly. And uh, if they decide that your manager can't see it, that's fine. It just stays confidential to you. What else can you do in your company to do that kind of thing? Now, why do we need to do this? Because in many companies, it doesn't work as well as it should, right? And uh, you know, Cargill is doing some of these things and they're doing a nice job of really improving. But why did they do that, Cargill? Uh, you know, what we heard from her, and we heard it from three other companies in this list that I won't name. They said, you know, George, it's easier to hire externally than it is to hire internally. And it shouldn't be that way. And so one of the reasons Cargo got into this is to help fix that problem. Um, take people that are already loyal to you and keep them loyal. Okay? So let's, uh, before we get, I'm going to get in and tell you some more stories, let's do another poll here. Let's go back to this one. And Eric, can you pop the, up the poll here? Now, this is multiple choice. Which of these three is your company good at? You can choose as many or as little as you want. I just realized, Eric, we didn't provide a none of the above, which we probably should have, but next time. So typically, you're going to be good at one of these things, uh, and that's good. Question is, are you good at all three? And which ones are you best at? And certainly, I have my in my head what might be there, and I'm sure Peter and the others do too. But it'll be interesting to see the, the data here and see what you say. How's it looking? Okay, this is what I expected. Peter, is that about what you expected? Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, it, certainly the learning, you know, uh, and we can talk a little bit about how well that learning process is going. That's really actually good to hear from our standpoint, doing a lot of good again, because some of those opportunities will be working with us and we can certainly help you with custom programs and with other things to make that happen. The other two though, the opportunities and the feedback. This is where the real struggle happens. You had a learning and development organization in the unit, in your company. Where do you put that same focus on career development pathways and on feedback and coaching? Um, the feedback tends to be about how you're doing in this job, much less on how you're developing, how you're stretching yourself for the others. So I want to share a couple examples here of companies that are doing putting these together into a real system. And uh, the first up is Amstead Industries. What I love about this company is this is not a high-tech company. This is not a financial company. This is not a consulting company. This is a steel company. This is a company that make things like the undercarriages for real cars or parts for the brakes or the car or, 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 or the clutches in cars, or they make those large cooling towers that, that go on top of, of 
uh, your building. This is not high tech, huge rocket science they're doing in terms of needing a bunch of MIT graduates. This is hardworking people doing really good work for real problems that need to be solved in the organization, but they're not really high tech problems. Now, they'll probably be upset that I called them not high tech, but hopefully you understand the difference there. What do they do? What's interesting? Every single non union employee in the company has a career development program built into their work. And what does this mean? My manager is responsible for making sure that I do my job well. And so we have our feedback process, our annual review process. It's, you know, it happens much more than annually there. But in addition to that, one of my boss's peers has an explicit responsibility to help me develop my career. So that peer, it's not my manager, it's a peer of my manager, sits down with me and says, what do you want to do? And we talk about it. And together then we put the, that that peer brings it back to the management team and says, hey, George wants to do these things. And they don't they debate and they say, well, you know, that kind of job doesn't exist here, but there's something like it over there. Or, yeah, we think we can do it. Here's the path. And so then they present back to me with the, the manager's peer, my development manager helping that committee presents back to me and says, here's a really good opportunity for you. Here's the things we can outline to help you make that happen. And if I accept that, then it's that boss's peers job to make sure that happens. And at the end of the year, it comes up that I get reviewed with my boss for my performance and my boss's peer gets reviewed for whether they helped me take steps along that path. It's fascinating because it gets your manager out of that discussion. It, second, it makes it really, really explicit that this matters to us. Uh, I have not seen this as much as well done in, in many other companies. And I love the fact this is not in a consulting company or a finance company that's happening. Uh, I did ask them, how hard is this? How much effort does this take? And I said, George, it sounds like a lot of effort, but it's something that um, we should be doing. And it's just, you know, a day or two a year of the development managers across all the people they're helping to develop. So you can find a day or two a year. You can find lots of reasons not to find it, but you can find that. And we give the attention to it to make sure they find that time. So it's, I think it's a really interesting process. Now that's for everybody, all the white collar workers in this company. Um, what else, where else can you do? Well, certainly we talked about fidelity. If you can't do it for the whole company, can you do it just for your unit? So we talked about fidelity and what they've done for the call center workers. That same thing, the idea of here's where you might go, here's how we're gonna train and give you the practice. And of course, give you the regular mentoring uh, call center and they got a whole lot of feedback all the time there. But then here's another one that I think is fascinating. Beth Israel, just like a lot of healthcare organizations have real trouble filling certain roles. And these tend to be the middle skill of non-college graduate roles. These are the lab technicians, that kind of thing, the assistants in the offices. It's just, our education institutions are not pumping enough of those people out and we need more and more of them in companies. So what Beth Israel said is forget about it. We can certainly go to the community colleges and hire people and we will do that. But why don't we start inside our company? So what they do is they go, if they're looking for a lab technician, they look in the cafeteria or they look at the reception desk and they say, you know what, George, you're a really good worker. We love the fact you come in on time. You are great with our customers. We just love the whole your whole attitude. And I know this job is not paying you all a whole lot of money right now. How about we help you become a lab technician? Have you ever thought about that? And people go, I'd never thought about it. This is not something I ever dreamed would ever be possible for me. It sounds like it, I need a lot of skills. And they say, that's exactly right. We're going to give you those skills. Over the next nine months, if you want to, we will continue to pay, your, pay you to do the job that you're doing. We'll also pay for your school, both in our company and, and at the local community college, to get some of the skills you need. And slowly, we'll transition you over to that role. And that role will pay you this much more money, and it'll be st steady hours, and it also gives you a career path that you didn't have any, anywhere else. Do you want that? So what do they do? They made the career path possible for people who hadn't thought about it. They're going to give them the learning and practice while not having to give up their job. And of course, all the way along the line, they're going to keep mentoring there. So if you can't do it for the whole company like Amstead does, can you do it for certain roles or can you do it for your people as you, as you want to move through there? This is what's possible, but we need to be very intentional about doing it. Okay? I want to do a little aside right before we switch over for questions. 
Uh, prior to this, we did some research on the learning and development function. And this is the function that you all said works pretty well. Most of you said this works pretty well in your company. Does it work well enough? If you're like many companies, the way that learning and development is happening is the way that I first experienced learning development when I entered the job market in the 80s. We hang a bunch of courses up there. And if you want to take the course, you go to your boss and see if your boss will allow you to do that and give you an accounting number to charge against. And whenever that course is offered, you can take it. Not exactly, that, that's maybe learning, not exactly development. Uh, now what's changed in the, since then? Well, we have digital courses. So you've got a lot of digital courses online. This is not that, you know, last century's processes as everything else has been transforming are not enough. And so we did some work on how should learning and development change? And here's this article called the Transformer Chief Learning Officer. This is just for that learning piece, right? But what it takes really is, do we wanna go from training people or do we want to go from transforming them and transforming the organization? And we see three things. This is certainly focused on the learning and development unit, but we can think beyond there too. Is, the, is this unit thinking really about offering courses or is it really about helping us to grow and develop the right mindsets? That's something that needs to be thought about differently in the L&D, but also something we can think about as managers. Why are we sending people to training and what else are we doing to help them get the ability, the confidence and the skills to grow, to do well now and to grow? The methods much more in the moment, part of the work as we need them, as opposed to waiting for when the courses are offered, much more learning central and personalized. And also that means that the learning units, the HR organizations need to become leaner, more agile, more strategic. Now this, you know, one way we could say this is, hey, HR folks, you're not doing what we want. We need you to do more. But another way to think about it is what can we as leaders do to help our people build the skills, the mindset, the confidence? What can we do to make sure they are getting to learn on the job, not just in the formal training? How can we get them the right experiences to happen there? And let's turn it one more side. As employees, can we start demanding this more? And can we start making this happen for ourselves even as the company starts to catch up? So certainly we want to improve the HR function, but I think we can do this all over. So if you're not asking this question, you can be sure that others are. If you're in HR and you're not asking this, people outside are asking about this and your employees are asking about this. And if you're not in HR, if you're a manager or an employee, what can you do to transform the way you're developing in your career? Digital transformation is happening everywhere. We're not seeing it as much in the way that people develop. And we're not seeing it as much in the way people develop careers. And I think that's one good reason why two thirds of the people who switch jobs are doing it because they're not getting development opportunities. That is a real loss for companies. You know how hard it is to hire people. You know how hard it is to train them. Why are we letting so many people go because we're not developing? So you can do this. You should do it. Make these things possible. Find, do the learning and the practice, do the feedback. This can happen in HR, but it can happen anywhere in the organization. It's good for the employees, but it's also good for you and for the company. So with that, I'll stop and we can take some questions. Great. Thank you so much, George. And uh, please do uh, great comments happening in the chat. But if you've got any questions you'd like uh, to put to George, put them in the Q&A and maybe I can just get things started a little bit here, George. Uh, just thinking back to something you said towards the beginning of your presentation, you talked about how much um, jobs and roles, uh, how fast they're changing and how, and how much they've changed. And so one question that we uh, hear quite often is, well, how on earth are you, you're asking us to develop, provide these career development pathways, or you're recommending that we do that, but how do we do pro provide career development pathways for careers that not only don't exist yet, we can't even imagine what they are? So I think that's a tough one. What we can imagine though is, um, oh, okay, I have my version of Moore's Law. Moore's Law, we all know, technology changes really quickly. It's Tends to, digital technology tends to move exponentially in organizations. My version of Moore's Law, um, I wasn't allowed to call it Westerman's Law, but we can call it that. It's that technology changes quickly, but organizations change much more slowly. And what was one of the things we found in the work of the future study is that although the, the potential is there for robots to eat a lot of jobs, it's happening a lot more slowly than we, had, than we thought. Because for the robots to eat the jobs, 
we need to change the processes those robots are in. And that's a slow process. So number one, the jobs are changing quickly, um, but we do have time to catch up. Now, having prepared that really long, long preamble to the answer, what is, what is the answer? Number one, the jobs we don't know about, the best we can do is aim for resilience, for human skills, those kinds of things, um, because that will allow us to adapt. But there are a lot of jobs that still exist that are going to be changing. And for those ones, we can help people start to adapt right away. So to continue this overly long answer, for example, as companies have gone into agile IT development, the role of the business analyst who used to write those long requirements documents has changed. And we need to stop people putting as many people into that role. And we need to help those people figure out where their skills might still be useful. And as another opportunity thing there, basically, if you are doing routine work, it's very likely that routine work will slowly leave your job because the computer will start to take it over. And so what can you and what can a manager do to start saying, as those pieces of jobs go away, what can we do to help people move to the next pieces? Or what can we do to help with the jobs that are left? So sorry for that really overly long answer, Peter, um, but hopefully that was helpful. Yeah, certainly. And a lot, a lot of what you described there also sounds like it could be in some ways sort of incremental skills building and developing development. I, I, you know, it's interesting you said that, Peter, because I think, you know, you've really hit a really important point here. It's very difficult. None of us, if we look back at our careers, would say starting at this point, we knew we would be there. Sorry, my wife is a doctor. She knew. But not a lot of us do. But what we do is we take a step and we figure out where to pivot from there. These squiggle type careers. So I think you're right, Peter. Peter. It's also it's a much more local thing than many of us think. And sort of building on that, quite a few people in the chat have been making uh, some version of the comment that uh, you know many companies and organizations may not actually. Uh, we want to keep our talent, uh, but we also might not have the immediate opportunities, particularly for these sort of transformational roles that uh, a, a lot of our employees perhaps are, are looking for, or maybe are even able to get by leaving uh, the company because we're in this uh, sort of skill shortage uh, situation. But at the same time, there are a lot of employers saying, we, you know, we can't find anyone, uh, you know, that has the skills that we, uh, that, that we need for these roles. But, you know, is there just a fundamental mismatch, I guess people are asking, and how do we deal with potentially unrealistic expectations for what career opportunities and how, quickly those opportunities can or should be available to, to employees. So first, if your organization is saying you can't do this for whatever reason, what you're saying is that we are happy to lose a lot of people because we're not developing them. And if you're that kind of organization, that's fine, as long as you know that you're doing it. Now, Peter, you had said about setting realistic expectations. You know, there are a lot of people I know, they start their companies and they want to be CEO. And it's unlikely they ever will. So part of the mentoring process is helping people understand what is possible for them. You know, we have a lot of people graduate from fashion design. Uh, my sister taught at a college that was graduated a whole lot of people for criminal lab development. Um, certainly entrepreneurship programs develop a lot of people. What is really realistic and in what time frame? We can do a lot to help mentor people to make those realistic expectations. Uh, that That's great. And so talking about the individuals, we've got quite a few questions about, you know, uh, I could ask this in two ways. One would be, uh, are we hiring uh, the people that we should be hiring if uh, they're not themselves uh, internally motivated to really go out and look for this kind of uh, manage their own development, as opposed to uh, expecting us, the organization, uh, to, to do it for them? And, so yeah, certainly, there are some yeah, good I... ways of assessing uh, that the companies use for kind of assessing the development and growth potential and orientation of, of, of employees, whether they're new hires or existing ones. So there are a lot of tools out there that you can use to assess different people. And, you know, the HR people can recommend some of those to you. Um, but that assumes that there's something inherent in people that cannot change. And to just a personal example, I was an engineer. I was the best person I knew at math and programming. And that was great but that wasn't gonna help me develop because I didn't have any use for people. And I had to learn over time what it means to work in an organization, what it means to grow for myself, to mentor, to put together opportunities that everybody wants to be part of. 
that was something that was not inherent in me. And I had to learn that over time. Um, more introverted people may be less willing to reach out in ways that others, but they might be incredibly capable once they get that opportunity. So we can say, listen, we should just be hiring only the people we want. That limits the job market for who we can hire. But second of all, it removes the, it, it kills the opportunity we have to take somebody and develop them so they can develop farther. And we're getting related to this a lot of questions uh, also uh, i'm looking at your uh, slide with the three pillars and the middle one being learning provide opportunities uh, to learn and practice um it, a lot of questions are coming in which will go along the lines if i can paraphrase it well we have those uh programs and those opportunities but employees uh, are not necessarily availing themselves uh, of them. You know, in many large organizations, we have tuition reimbursement, right? We've got thousands of dollars a year that we could spend on education. Very few people uh, actually uh, you, you use that. And so two parts to the question, do you have any uh, hypothesis for why that is the case? Uh, and do you have any suggestions for, or have you come across any uh, examples of companies where, or organizations where, uh, people really are taking advantage of those learning opportunities that are being provided. So uh, let me say, first of all, that congrats on doing these opportunities that are out there. And the question we want to ask ourselves is, is that is it designed because that was easy for us to do or is it designed because it's good for the employees? So let me just give you a couple examples. We've done some very interesting work and, and some survey research, uh, literature review and some survey research on how do highly educated and less educated workers think about development opportunities. And one of the really critical differences is that the less educated workers may have stopped their education because they didn't feel they were good at it. And so if you give them another educational opportunity, what you're saying is, well, you know, take something here, take something you're not good at and maybe it'll work out for you. So that's one of the one challenge. Add to that the tuition reimbursement. Tuition is expensive. Even assuming that I have the ability to take time to put the money down and then to take time out of my schedule to take a semester's worth of classes, often I'm not going to get reimbursed until halfway through the next semester. So now we're asking them to put out two semesters worth of work before we get invested for the first. And if I wasn't ever a very good student and I only get paid back if I get a certain grade, that's even more risky to me. So what's the difference between what is easy to create and what actually works for the workers we're trying to help, we need to think through that in a better way. Um, we've had a few questions uh, about essentially culture. So what is it about organizational culture in your experience that that gets in the way, has prevented, you know, if these, if, if these are such obvious and good ideas, you know, why is it not happening? It seems like maybe it's something to do with, with, with culture and, uh, do you think that's true? And if so, have you, in your research, have you found any examples of companies that have been able to break through that? And if so, how? Uh, so my favorite example of companies breaking through that right now is what's happening at Microsoft. You know, Satya Nadella has done a lot of brilliant things in running that company. But one of the things he did from the very beginning of the company is we're going to change our culture here from less on just focusing on metrics and on performance and, and much more to turn this into a growth mindset. We're going to try to go from know-it-alls to learn-it-alls. And they work very hard over years to develop that culture that you don't need to know everything, but you need to constantly figure out how you can grow, how you can do better, how you can innovate better. And it's really shown great performance there. Another example I like a lot is um, DBS Bank in Singapore. And DBS Bank was so rigid and such a poor doing such, such a poor job that they were the worst of the top five banks in Singapore for customer experience. Um, the joke was that DBS stood for Dinosaur Bank of Singapore. And they went out, when they went out to changes, certainly they improved their processes, but they engaged every employee in making the place better. And as part of that, they had to help people realize what was possible and to not be scared about the changes were coming in. So they trained people in, in some of these key digital skills and what might be happening but they also created these learning days where people could teach other people about what they were learning. And that could be about how to code something. It could be about what digital marketing is. It might be you know, how to cook some good meal. But the opportunity to teach your peers also became an opportunity to think about 
how you teach and how you learn and how you grow over time. So over the four years, they went from being the worst bank in Singapore to being the best. And this idea of engaging all the people in it was a huge part of that. So in the companies that you've seen doing this well, and again, I'm paraphrasing a few questions uh, here that have come in the Q&A, uh, you know, where, where is the impetus uh, really come from? You know, is it, is it uh, sort of managers throughout the organization who've been sort of voting with their feet? Is it an HR initiative? Uh, is it just something about a particular senior executive or an initiative really that the CEO has, has driven? Uh, you know, what's, what's, what's been in the companies that you've looked at, the pattern of well, how they yeah. arrive at these kinds of systems that you're describing? So what happened at Fidelity, um, and actually I believe that the, the uh, Beth Israel one, that was started by managers in the middle of the organization saying, I have a problem in my function, let's make that happen. When it happens in a more systemic thing, it really does come from the top. And occasionally there's an HR leader who says, we're going to make this happen. Often it's the, the, the CEOs of the world replace the HR person with a person who's willing to make this happen. The challenge, one of the challenges we have in HR is HR is very much about stability in most companies. It tends to be very risk averse. And that means that driving some of these innovations, it's going to be disruptive. It's going to be disruptive, not in the innovation sense, but disruption in terms of causing trouble. Uh, and the HR organizations are not always geared from that. Um, and so we need to we need to sh change the way the HR organizations think so that they can help change the way the whole organization works. I want to come back to it, though. When it works, it works really well. And those are the examples I showed you. But when it's not working, then that means that we as people in the middle of the organization can still take it on ourselves to do something different. Uh, and what would that, what would yeah. be some examples of the things that people who hear you saying that and say, yes, that's my situation. But okay. help, help so what can you do? Them. What can you do? You can help your people figure out how to get the, the more personalized, the more granular, what I call atomized learning as part of what they do. You can help your people start to stretch. You can try to figure out where, where they're going and, and help them get there. You can reach out to the rest of the organization and try to find people that want to, that are interested. You might want to give some mentoring or give an opportunity in your unit. You can do these learning days in your unit to have people teach each other, to help them learn from each other. And you can engage with all the people, especially the people that are not college educated in your company, and help try to help them figure out where do they want to go, how do they want to move, because it may not be the kind of thing they feel comfortable asking for themselves or even dreaming for themselves. These are all things you can do with your teams, even as you wait for the, the rest of the company to catch up. That's helpful. And, you know, I find that, you know, even in this discussion, a lot in the, in the questions, a lot seems to come back to uh, the, you know, what does the individual do? What does their direct manager uh, do? But one of the examples that you talked about uh, that I think was very intriguing was uh, going outside of uh, the, the line management and, you know, not sort of, uh, HR either, but other peers, but other managers and leaders within the organization being developmental partners or mentors or buddies for 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 for, for people that aren't in their direct uh, line of reporting. Could you say a little bit more about uh, about that model? Because I, I think a lot of people will not have come across uh, anything like that. And I'm sorry. I can you repeat your question quickly? I was reading some of the chats and I. Only heard about half of what you said. Sorry about that. So, uh, this was going back to the example that you gave of having a, sort of a career coach or mentor who is not in your line management uh, mm -hmm. sort of vertical uh, as a as a model of getting uh, mentorship and guidance that isn't you know it's not coming from HR, it's not coming from your manager. That's it. That was a very interesting example. I think a lot of people probably have not come across that. So we'd like to hear a bit more about that. You know, something that, that I like about the UPMC approach about find somebody who who used to be in your job is that person then becomes a potential mentor for you. You know, you can contact them and you can find out. And the worst they're going to say is no. Uh, these affinity groups in organizations also have become really interesting mentorship opportunities. So, uh, you know, the formal programs can be a little trickier, but if you can reach out and make things happen, I know a lot of women who are involved now with women's empowerment efforts and women's development efforts or so other people can grow up to be those are all good examples of how you can take a part to help mentor other people 
Hey, Peter, I want to come back to some questions. I think we might have um, uh, come across, I might have come across as being a little bit mean towards HR people. And I'm seeing a couple of the comments in there that said, hey, we don't develop people, our managers do. That, you know, we need senior management to let us happen, let that happen. We've heard HR people want to make this change happen, but they, the rest of the organization won't let us. I Please, if I made you feel like I was picking on HR people, you have a really hard job to do. So assuming you got the right mindset, that's the first step, right? And in many organizations, you don't, uh, you don't, HR doesn't. But assuming you got the right mindset, then you have the same challenge in it problem that anybody does in an organization, which is convincing anybody that your way of thinking is the right way to think and in making that happen. So how do you do that? You paint a good picture, you try some prototypes, you develop some ally, ally, allies, and you grow that story over time. So then you can bring that back and say, see, don't we wanna do this bigger? So just as we talk about in engineering and in marketing, doing those experiments, and those experiments get you from chalkboard into real life, you can try to do those same things. Um, how can we try a few little things? Find a manager that wants to work with us, and from there, grow these things out beyond and beyond. I think that's a good point, and thank you for picking it up. And in fact, in the chat, I see that uh, Leslie, who's a, an HR person, uh, went as far as I think suggesting also that a challenge is, you know, um, and where are my tea? How do you? How does one quantify uh, the the benefits of uh, the approaches that you're describing here? Maybe in our last couple of minutes, that would be a, a, a good challenge for for you, which you've been engaging in uh, not only. Uh, conceptual discovery, but you know, trying to understand what the uh, what the data is around this. So, what advice do you have on how to quantify uh, for the business leaders uh, the the, the uh, benefits of doing what you're proposing? So, number one, start measuring, right? So, you know, we tell everybody that they need to put performance development uh, development as part of the annual annual reviews. How many people are actually doing it? And how many people are doing it in a meaningful way? Uh, what are we doing with the pulse surveys we've got for employees and how much do we think about this as a part of the, part of the employee satisfaction stuff? Then once you start to measure, what do you do with those measures, right? Do we see some units have better satisfaction than others and what do we do with it? Do we see that some initiatives are doing better? Do we see that people are growing? A very simple one. General Electric a few years back looked at their course catalog and they did a very simple analysis. It, when we look at whether people took this course, did the dial move for their performance later? They had their they had their performance reviews. They know what's happened, and they took out something. I think it was like a twenty five percent of their courses that were not moving the dial in any way. So, the first thing is to start measuring, and second is as imperfect as the measures tend to be, can we start to use them to start making some other decisions? Now, it's what you want to be able to say is what everybody wants to say. If I invest a million dollars, we'll get a $5 million return. That's hard. But if you start doing these experiments and seeing whether things change, or if you start looking back and saying, given what we've done, does performance change? That's a big start on it. And I know we're getting close, but one other thing to look at is the work that Google did a while back to identify what makes a good manager. There was a quantitative study to identify what were the elements in what, what, what it takes to get there. They, they got at that through looking at numbers, not just through guessing at some of this stuff. Great. Okay, Lee, one more thing. Yes, Sorry, I keep wanting to go longer, but AI is a huge opportunity here too. And we are out of time, but maybe we could talk about that more in a different time. I think that's a great lead into a potential future, uh, or in fact, I'm certain future webinar that we will do around the implications of AI. But for now, George, thank you so much uh, for spending this hour with us. There were a lot of questions. Uh, thank you all for joining us and for engaging with each other and uh, with us. If you're interested in the uh, future of workforce learning, the Global Opportunity Forum that uh, uh, George has created here at MIT, that's gof.mit.edu. Please go and take a look at that very interesting uh, project. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing uh, you all uh, again, hopefully uh, in future webinars. Uh, and it just remains for me to thank George very much for joining us. If you liked George, and would like to spend a bit more time uh, with him, you can also see him in our executive education courses here on campus and also 
uh, online in the digitized format that George was uh, mentioning. Thank you again for joining us. I look forward to seeing you in future webinars and maybe in classes and programs. And George, above all, thank you so much for sharing your work with us, uh, your insights, uh, and for being so generous with your time. Thank you, George. Thanks, everybody, for listening.